Okay. What I love about Zoom nowadays, they ask you if you still want to sit in the meeting, which is being recorded. So everyone has got a freedom of speech. <laughs> okay. And once again, welcome. I thought, let me share my story because each time when I speak to people, they say, wow, you have been through that, you have done that, and how do you do it? So I think this might be a few series. I don't want you guys to stay long. It might, this one might be 45 minutes to an hour, we'll see. But if you still want me to stay long, let me know because I don't want to take you out from your PC Saturday and we can carry on. But I know next week, some hours, I was busy meditating this morning, trying to figure out what message do I need to speak about. And today I won't speak about self-sabotage, father wounds and mother wounds, which I've been through and the learnings that you can get from there. So basically today, I'm just gonna talk about who I am. Most of you know me as Nsieni, on my social media is Nsieli Keti Wembele and my ID names is Jemina Nsieli Mbele. I know the Jemina, few people know them, know it, but some know it. So that is who I am. And since October, I've changed my shoot. I feel like my shoot resonates with who I am and where I'm going and what I've been always learning. And I think I'll do another live of name change of what the importance of name change. Because when I think of Nsieni, Nsieni means leave me, leave me behind, Ongishieni. And when I reflect for the past 43 years, I've been left by so many people, I've been left by so many opportunities and my soul has been saying, you want to shine, you want to have luck, you want, God to guide you. So that is where the name Mashudu comes from as well. So it resonates with me. And I remember when I started working in the mining industry, when they see Jamie Nancy, they'll call me Jeremiah, which was really insensitive. So throughout my, my career life, it was being called a man, or else I'm not a man, being called Jeremiah instead of Nancy. Uh, I remember when I left DBS, that is after I've worked for seven years, I changed and seen, I said, I'm not going to take Jamila. So people, it will only be been seen by my employer or anyone when they see my records, so I'll say in CN. And in CN for many, it was also difficult. Many people changed it in CN and all that. But when I changed my shoe, it was quite effortless and I, embrace the name so i'm quite excited i know to so many it was like what is really happening is she confused but i'll share one day the full story behind the name this is just a summary so who am i i thought let me share that who am i i would say um i'm a shudu i'm a goddess i'm a healer I'm a child of God as well. And um, I've got so many titles behind me, which people give me. One of them is being a mom, being a wife, being an employee. I also do in uh, philanthropy as well. And I'm also a friend. I'm also a confidant. I'm also a, I'll say a human being in this society, adding value. But at the end of the day, it's what makes, what fulfills me just being me. And being me, it has been quite hard to really understand with me. And yeah, that is why also the name change comes from. So with finding out who's me, I've been through a journey. I would say most of my childhood life, I don't remember it that well, but I just remember up to, I think up to 10 from early, earlier, it's not that much. And then I remember around eight, 10, I still remember what happened. Yeah, it wasn't a good childhood and I was surrounded. I didn't grow up with my father. I only found out my father died when I was three. That is when I was 26 years old because I thought he died when, when I, was, I was born 
because that is where I used to think and see any comes from. And even today, my family, my mom, having told me what it means, even my brain is late. So I think there's a story behind it. So yeah, I grew up with, yeah, I would say somewhere to in a four bedroomed house with uncles and, and aunts and all that. So without a father figure and yeah, it was quite challenging in a, a luxury and just growing up and being in a big family and your granny taking care of you and everyone just seeing the dynamics because when a, you're a human being you're being you get shaped by people by the surroundings and the caregivers that have been with you around you so yeah i grew up and then i started going to church my mama she still goes to we grew up uh, yeah, at Zioni, and then I remember when I was 10 minutes, I said, I'm Zioni, I'm going to join Jehovah's Witnesses, and I joined. And I'll say that has that helped me as well, because being in Okshin and the peer pressure, it, it helped me so much. I'll say I'll forever be grateful to be introduced to that by my neighbors. The beauty is that my mom never. I never thought that mother wasn't going with her to a church, but I used to go, I know what they do. Yeah. And it was only, I know Magunom Shana and Usbu is here, it's an issue. Then my clothes will be wet, I'll be fighting with Nyem Shana and all that. But besides that, I became strong. I think that is one of the messages that I wrote that I need to share, the perseverance and resilience of, the things that that you go through, besides what is going through, it just builds the character that is in you. So throughout growing up, being a youth, and there was a book in Jayabusa, young people asked, that helped me because with how we grew up not having a dad, growing up in a big family, you couldn't even speak up. I know people mostly when they see me, they say I'm quiet. If they knew my mind is forever talking, I'm forever talking. It's what I adopted when I was young because one couldn't express themselves. And then you might say now you're able to express yourself. It's something that you learn. One couldn't express themselves. I couldn't ask questions about growing up, what happens and it's like when one when I was growing up, I just wanted to be out of where I was. So that book really helped me answering the questions that I needed and also shielding me and also being close to God. So that is what I will, I will, yeah, I, will I just wanted to share on that. And throughout, I remember when I was 14, I even wrote something yesterday. My sister said I should make it a blog. It was the people that always surround you, they're quite important. I never realized the value of having mentors and coaches. And I didn't know when I was 14 that those people that I approached were being mentors and coaches. One of them, I remember because I love reading, I learned from that, he said, for you to, to prosper and to be a different person and to know what is happening within the universe, start reading, go to the, life, to the library. As much as you are learning at school, the books that you are learning won't give you the other information that you need to learn. So I started going to the library, going to a president street. How I got, I remember by that time my mom wasn't working because she stopped working when I was doing standard, standard five. That was great. That was great. What is standard five? What grade will that be? I think it's grade seven. Yeah, grade seven. Yeah. Yes, it was grade seven. So she wasn't working by then. So I was also helped by my late uncle who was a musician by then. So I went to the library. Even then I didn't have clothes. I'll wear the same clothes on the weekend just to go. And, but the beauty that I learned is that reading is amazing. It opened my eyes. I even forgot that I was a student. I remember I was exposed to books like emotional intelligence, human behavior. That is where my love for working with people started because I was trying to reflect when did this start? And I'll do my work and still go to this part of the library where you are reading about psychology, philosophy, 
so I was just saying, I'm so grateful that those people were there to, to guide me and for me to reaching out is something that we don't do as people lately. Even now, I think with COVID, COVID has made us just to shy away, to stay in a corner and stop and not asking for help. And just raising your hand and just asking for help is so amazing. So I'm grateful that I learned from a young age, which I didn't know what I was doing, to ask for help. And I remember even when I was doing my trick, I didn't know what I was going to do with my trick. And then there was a, a neighbor, he was busy studying and asked him, what are you studying? How do I do this? And then he told me, go to Funda Center. I know at the moment it's no longer there. And so wait to Funda Center, you get information about different companies, what to apply and read. So it was just having an inquiring mind. So the message that I'm just sharing is that ask, have an inquiring mind. If you're not a person who read, start reading. You'll be so amazed of what you need to uncover. And you might also discover something about your peoples if you don't know what your peoples is. And you will find that you'll dis discover new talents that you're not aware of. Yeah, any questions on that? Before I move on. Are you still with me? No questions. <laughs> uh, I've got a question, Sandy. Yes. About the name change. So what do you prefer to be called? Uh, <laughs> we know you as <laughs> <in> C. <laughs> For me, that name still uh, stands. So do we go and change our contacts on the phones? And what do you prefer to be called now? I, I prefer to be called Mashudu. And also with the name change, I'm gonna change it in, the, in my ID. <laughs> so it's quite big. That is why I say one day I'll do a Zoom in terms of the name, it's quite big. There's so much stories behind the name. So at the moment, my ID is still in C and I know even at, at, at my employer, they still, so I know when I'm at my employer, I just switch off and then I accept being called in C. But yeah, I'll, you can change my contacts to my children. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Are you able to say my children? <laughs> Yeah, I know I'm used to that. Yeah. <laughs> I've changed already. Awesome. Even, changed. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Even me, I changed. So I think before end of the year, it would have been changed in my ID. So that is something that I'm working on. Yeah. So do you know what my should mean? Maybe I should just elaborate because it's something that you asked. <laughs> She's still bugging me. Okay. So my should do. Okay, let me just open. There's a website which says it beautifully. When I read it after the name change, I was like, wow. So Mashudu represents compassion. It represents creativity. It represents reliability, generosity, loyalty, and love for people. Would you say that's me? That. Yes. And yeah. I, have a I agree. Question. A quick question: Is there? Mama. Sorry about my background. It's is fine. Your, is, is, is your name change in terms of the um, the South African landscape? Does it have any connection to your father's side of the family or? Is it just something that you identify with as a person? 
it's something that I identify with as a person. I think since I was a teenager, because I've always asked, what does Nsiani mean? Because Nsiani means leave me behind. But you know, with us African, there's always a <laughs> drama behind the name. Because even my mom's name is, yeah, my mom's name is Mburaheni. That means kill me. So I don't know what was happening when she was when she was conceived, when she was being born. So yeah, names have, have got power over someone's life. So in terms of the name, I also meditated on the name and yeah, the name was always coming through. Thank you for that. And then another, yes, you want to? Another meaning of Mashudis means providential, which means favorable, heaven sent, because I believe I'm heaven sent. Because nowadays people will tell me this and this, I'm like, okay, this connects with the name. So I'm getting so many messages that connects with the name and how I'm living my life now. Any other questions? Nothing for me, thanks. Okay. So I'll, I'll continue with my story of saying, learning to read, learning being being close to books. And also when I was young, I didn't have friends. My brain was quite strict. <laughs> She'll say, when you come back from school, you stay at home. So yeah, even now my family at times would just leave me. I'm so used to it. My husband, I always tell him that I'm a loner most of the time as well. And it's only in my adulthood where I'm learning to make friends. It doesn't come easy. It's not to say, I don't wanna be close to people who just, the how how I was cultured, but I'm learning to reach out because we can change habits and our character over time, provided it's, it's beneficial and it goes with your soul. So when after 14, one is becoming a teenager, and then you get exposed to different people, different boys. And yeah, and it looks in kids, girls are having kids left and right, and you just feel like, oh my word, what's really happening? Am I in the right place? And yeah, it was quite challenging having to to work on your mind because I just learned, I think the past 10 years is just the power of the mind. And when I relate that I was really training my mind not to be affected much by peer pressure, as much as it affected me, because I remember with the clothes, even at high school, you know, high school, when it's days where you have to wear home clothes, oh, that was a nightmare for me. It was, I really dreaded going to school. And also with the boys not being the favorite, and then the boys passing and you go like, what's really happening with me? And then now you're older, you're 43, you go to your Facebook, you get messages on your messenger, people say hi, baby, and you go like, what has changed? <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, that is quite interesting. So it was quite a challenging childhood with my mom not working, having been supported by my late grandma and my uncle who was singing, providing. They, I think, what made me stronger is because I saw abuse. I saw girls being abused. I saw also my uncles abusing his wives. And I, from there I told myself, no, I'm not gonna live this life. I really need to work hard besides what is happening with me. I need to work hard. Education would be the thing that will help me. So yeah, I think it created trauma seeing those and just seeing that you become lifeless, like seeing someone being beaten. And now when you look in, into television, it's just like second nature seeing abuse. 
people beating each other, whether males or females, females hitting men, men. So yeah, it was something that we could, I, I, I saw and now it's rife on TV and I'm, I don't like watching violence. I just cringe when I see that because of what I was exposed to. And also seeing ladies being told not to go to school at a young age. And I told myself, I'm not going to have a boyfriend who's going to control me. So I'm just going to stay and concentrate on my books. And I think that helped as well. I would say it was a benefit to be exposed to that because I don't know how my life would have been now. It would have been something else. And even that, I remember also, which I'll talk about, I think in the next one, which was about the mother wound. It wasn't easy growing up in the house, having your mom and your granny and your granny being basically your mom. Because I would say even now, I miss I was more closer to her because she was there for me. And with my mom, it wasn't. And it's only later now when you learn that she went through trauma of her own and I cannot judge how she behaved. But then when you're a young child and you go like, why did someone bring you to, to this world? And you go like, and they don't care. So it comes back to the word of self-love. Before this session, I even wrote in my Facebook, I said, when did you ever feel self-love? I would say for me, I ever felt self-love, I think in my 20s, and then I felt like it disappeared because life was happening, getting married, having kids, working, all the drama which one never got exposed to. So yeah, that, that yeah, yeah, for a long time, I went like, how does one give birth to someone and then not care? And I would say I was quite fortunate that my queen was there, she was quite supportive. And yeah. I would say she's the one, even when I was working for the mines, going to school, she'll make it a point to know where I'm staying, where I'm living, and all that. I'm like, wow, I was really touched because I feel like if that didn't happen, I still feel God protected me. I don't know what I would have been. Because when one is not exposed to love from a mother and also not having a dad, you start looking for love in the in the wrong places, which I also did, I remember. I think before I get to that, I also did, I'll note that before I get to that story. So it's quite important even now as you're raising your kids, show them how much you love them. You don't have to, to buy gifts, just learn to connect with them, understand their language and understand what they are going through. We let work and life take over and we forget that we brought these offsprings to, to life and they need that love because if it's a girl and you, you're a father, that your daughter will always remember the love. How you treat her is how she's going to accept to be treated by other guys out there. So be present, be the person that you always talk about. I've seen in Facebook, uh, I, I get jealous when somebody says, yo, my dad taught me this, my dad taught me this, I miss you. Yeah, it's so, it's beautiful and I wish I had that. And I also see it with my daughter, the, the relationship that she has with her dad. So make sure, and if you've got a son as well, make sure you bond with them. Currently the world at the moment, kids are committing suicide because they don't know a belonging. They'll get married and it'll treat the girls because they don't know what is love and they don't know how to take care of someone because they don't know how to love themselves. Because if you don't love yourself, you're gonna allow people to to control you, to manipulate you, to do so many things, which is something that happened. I remember when I was in tertiary, tertiary I told myself, ah, now I don't, I don't have to be under my, my granny's roof. I can be myself and you get exposed to all this alcohol, religion and all that. So someone will say, yo, Here's the sweet koyan, I've, I've seen it all. I've seen the drugs, I've seen the smoking, I've seen the abuse, I've seen the, I've been through being used by 
men who are, who are married, when I didn't know. So that's why at times when you grow up, you look, you have to look and not judge. And that is why it's important your relationship between your kids is important so that they don't go through that where they have to deal with what is self-love. Because you and even yourself, you don't know what it is. Learn, find someone to teach you. Because the moment you are able to do it, you'll be able to reciprocate it to your kids. Because this is the chance that we can change what is going to happen even when we are not there by creating the foundations for our kids. So that is quite important. I know we've got bills to pay, but bills can stand a human life. You can never repair it because that child is going to bother you. They'll be into drugs. They'll be into so many things. They'll be hitting people and you go like, what has happened? And then you blame their friends and you forget that the foundation started at home. So if you've got father wounds, mother wounds yourself, heal them so that you make sure the next generation, the kids that you have, they become the change in the world. Don't say it's already happening. They might be the ones who need to change the world by showing the love, by, by healing the nation, yeah. Any questions on that? No, nothing. Thank you so much for sharing and just being vulnerable and opening up. Eh? <laughs> I hope you're not crying. <laughs> I'm yeah. sure tear now and then. <laughs> yeah. No question from my side as well. But I'm just yeah. looking at what you went through not having the mother and the father support. I had them both, but the teachings, I could not say what, like when you were saying that you see people posting that my father taught me this, my mother taught me that, my father especially, he was, <laughs> he was just there. <laughs> I don't know, maybe he didn't know how to raise kids or something, but that is, was the missing part. In, in my life as well. That father teachings from a father to a girl child, you know. <laughs> but yeah. uh, we, we, we were fine, we lived. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, that's why I'm really emphasizing though that even if you are there, be present, be active in your kid's life because they were planted into you, into your life, so that they can also teach you. So I was telling one of my clients on, when, on Thursday, and it, I was, we were just talking about life and you were just telling me all the things that I told him to do and he's doing. And I reminded him that go and reflect and find out why your kids planted in your life. Why did they choose? To be with you because every kid that we have they need to change us they need to teach us something they need to help us to evolve and when we are busy looking at life looking at the jones and everything and forget about the family structure and you'll miss out on the lesson that you need to learn as well because they've been planted into you and you we don't own them that's the other thing that is something that i've learned it's a privilege to have kids. There are people who can have kids as well. The fact that they've been planted to us, it's a blessing on its own. And we need to nurture that blessing to serve the world as well. Welcome, Nontantla. Yeah, okay. So I was still, okay, I think I jumped. Let me take it back. So I, in, as, as I said, when I was 14, I started reading, studying, yeah, managing the, the challenges. And then 1994, we had Inca and ANC fighting. That is when we're having our democracy. That was a, a, a challenging time for most of us. I was doing matric, I remember, in 1994. And for me, yeah, I remember that year, if I didn't run away from home, I'll never run away from home. 
So that year was quite challenging having outside the family structure, you've got this violence and almost being killed when the Igata were going to to bury one of the of theirs, because the street that we stayed in is so it to say it's on the way to Evano. So that day, me and my grandma, we missed a bullet by like that. I don't know how, how we died, because the thing that they used to do is that when you're when they're going to, to a funeral, they'll make sure that they kill people on the road. And we died, and yo, we were trembling. And still to this day, I go like, wow, I wasn't meant to die, and I need to, to embrace this body and embrace this life I'm in. Besides that as well, when, cause I was doing a trick, we were going to school Monday to Sunday, cause I told myself because of the violence, the abuse that I'm being exposed to, which you see daily. So you have to study and see your sister-in-law crying, asking for money and all that. He's still go like, oh. So when I was busy writing my trick, my mom didn't want to allow me to write my trick. So that was another challenge. And then I said, what am I gonna do? I need to write my metric. I need to get away, get out of this poverty, or out of this lifestyle and what I'm exposed to. So I, I spoke to the school principal and then they, they, they connected me with social workers. And then, yeah, I was like, yo, now you're gonna challenge your mom. <laughs> so yeah, I went to the social workers and then they came and they spoke to her and then I had to be removed from, from, the, from the house. So I was removed and then, so I can write my metric. And then my, my, my friend, yeah, she's not here today. Oh, they asked if, they asked the family if they can stay with me so I can write my metric. Because being exposed to uh, being at home, my mom would put water, she didn't want me to study. So that was the only way I could be safe. So I'm quite grateful to her and them. And then I wrote my exam staying with them and then still going to school seven days so that we pass. And then it paid off because I passed, I did well kicking and screaming because I knew what is the end goal. So I think that is why I like presenting what is this workshops on goals and vision because I had envisioned this life that I want, I, that I'm not going to repeat a grade, I'm not going to do this. So just visualizing. So I think those were the things that I was learning on this journey. So I passed and then, then I didn't know what I was going to study. And I did well. I remember my vendor, most I'm vendor. I bought a B in vendor. Don't tell me that my accent doesn't sound vendor. It has been diluted for almost how many years? I haven't been at school for 27 years. So the past 27 years, my vendor has been diluted by speaking Zulu, Tosa, Tonga, and all that. And most of the time, I've never lived in vendor where well, I'll speak Venda most of the time and I've never stayed home since 18 where I'll speak Venda. So yeah, that is where my accent changed. So I did well. And then I, I met another guy who said, your math and science is not that great. You might struggle. So I, I learned about MeTech. MeTech is one of the government institution. They do research is based in, in Renbeck. So they've got, by that time, because they could see that they were students who had potential, but because of where they were studying and their backgrounds, they, they couldn't do well in maths and science. So I upgraded my maths and science. So I applied and they took me. So I joined MinTech. I became part of their like employees because that time, I even got a stipend. That is when I was introduced to a stipend in 1995. So I used to look forward to the 15th of each month getting a salary and still being a student. And that helped because I was able to buy clothes. I was able to, 
buy things that I needed without having to depend on other people. And the beauty was with me, there was a bus that will take you from Bara. So I just had to make sure daily I made Bara on time to catch the bus to run back and then coming back. And they also gave us food and they gave us the best teachers in the world. I was so amazed. We were really taken good care of. And then June, they took, they, we, it was during VEC work. So they took us to one of the mines. It was in Springs. And then that is where I got exposed to, to, to metallurgy and mining. And then in November, I worked for them because they've got a research. So June, I did extraction metallurgy, running the plant, doing samples. And then December was doing what we call physical metallurgy, looking at something like this, testing the strength and stretching it and working on it. That is what we call physical metallurgy. But through that, through I'll say 1995 was a blessing. It was like for the first time I was relaxed. I didn't have to worry about anything. All I had to worry about is studying. I was taking good care of I had money. It was just quite amazing. But the and the only challenge was that I wanted to be a doctor. <laughs> And I couldn't because I was scared of blood. It's only now, now I can watch Grace Anatomy when people are, are doing cutting people and all that. I can even watch it now. So I guess I was supposed to or just being a chicken, just being scared. I should have just really faced my fears. So I didn't pursue being a doctor, then I pursued metallurgy which was what I was exposed to because I was at Mintech. And then I passed very well. I got C's higher grades in math and science. My English was well, because they also brought a English tutor. So throughout the whole year, it was like we in a school, but we were in this small private school with other students who were, we were 12. And what was amazing, one of them contacted me after 26 years, I was like, wow. And I remember, I don't know where he got my number and he says, hi, Jemina. And see, you know, like this one who calls me Jemina, he knows me from far. So it was quite interesting that he's still alive and we're still connected. So I was quite impressed with that. So they offered me a bursary. So the bursary I didn't take it because it was only gonna pay for tuition and it won't pay for accommodation. Then since I've learned to research, I started asking around, I applied for a bursary and then I got one from Goldfields. Goldfields, they own mines in Caltonville, in what you call Lebanon and Glen Hardy, Kloof, and they also used to own one in, in Greenside, which is with Bank, I work there. So. I took their bursary instead of taking Minter because they as was gonna pay for everything because I went like, I cannot go around and asking for money because this one just pays and then just give up. So I took theirs, but with theirs, I had to work for six months. So 1996, I joined them. I worked for them for six months and that was another, I'll say start of another roller store. They gave me, they assigned me to a mine which was in Caltonville, which was uh, West Street Gold Plant. And with that, they gave me a house, a flat, which was unfinished, imagine, just from school. Uh, and mostly what they do, because with white kids, they would have everything. So now I'm just this black child. Give you a house, nothing, just unfinished. So yeah, so for a month I stayed in a house which wasn't finished and it was quite challenging. <laughs> so yeah, I asked around and, and where I was staying, I was staying in town in the plan is very far. I don't even have a car. So I had to make means of getting to work, but I remember I never, I went to work daily. I was never late because of the help that I got from other people for, for asking. So, but it was quite difficult just even that experience, but I guess it was, they were testing me. And back in 1996, 
in that plant, they didn't have toilets for women. So it was quite challenging as well, having to be exposed, working shifts and you go like, when you go to the bathroom, you have to ask a man to stand for you outside. So it was like not being yourself, being controlled. But I told myself this will end in six months because I know what, I'm, what is the end goal. And then I persevered through all this. I would say it was some induction of some sort. I still don't know how I survived it even today. Yeah, so I survived that. Then I went back, I went to school, went to school. I did well in my first three years. I studied being exposed to all the things that I mentioned, alcohol, drinking, going to church, different people being dumped. So being exposed to that, sorry, and all that. So yeah, it was quite interesting, but it built me. It, it didn't break me. But there were times I went like, God, what is this? What is it that I need really to learn? But always remember that I don't want to go back to where I come from. I still want to be independent and I want to take good care of myself. I see that Refilo joined us. Welcome, Refilo. Any questions on this before I carry on with the story? Are you still following me? Hopefully you're not crying. Yes, As I'm saying the story, what is coming to your mind? I think poor thing to interrupt will just diffuse from the thought process of art processing from what you are processing with us right now. And is it making sense? Don't worry about the thought process. I've got my post-its so that I don't <laughs> forget. <laughs> okay, I don't see anyone talking. So with that, having worked for six months, so as a land official metallurgist working for this mine, and then also as getting a salary. So you understand why I'm mentioning this, how this helped three years later, because there are things in life, whatever you're going through is quite important that you, even now what you're going through, it might not make sense. And you might be going through some difficulties, just write it. You'll realize later when you read it, the, the puzzle starts to fit in. So I was getting a salary when I was working for them for six months. I did well, even though I was really treated so badly with that bad induction, which I never thought, but I persevered. And also I still told you about my granny. My granny knew where I was staying. She came all the way to see where I was staying, which didn't happen with my mom as well. So she still came and saw where I was staying, what I was doing, what I was exposed to. Even though we didn't have a car, so we're using Texas, but the fact that she went out of the way and still came up and see where is this child staying? Not to say she's gone to the world, to the mines and everything will, will just see. So I was quiet. I think that also helped me and kept me strong. So then going to school, studying this metallurgy, then metallurgy is a different, going to varsity, I think it's a trauma on its own because you are never ready for what is going to happen there and you will never get inducted of what is going to happen there because some people, it's either their life change for the worst and others, it becomes better. Because you get to school, you get lectures, we don't even care about you. Whether you are there, the class carries on, there are exams, there's this, you need to navigate where it's what. And then having to learn that when you get 51% is a distinction. So I remember in my second year, second year for me was the toughest because we used to have what we call metallurgical chemistry. You know, that subject, I don't know how we passed. We wouldn't sleep for days just studying it. And the fact that you get 50 or 51, you'll celebrate. 
we'll walk our, I never stayed in a race when I was in tertiary. So I always stayed in a flat. So the first three years I was staying in a flat. So we'll celebrate with our classmates and we'll walk to, we're staying in Berea, we'll walk to a, a spa, a, a hill bro. And then we'll go and buy JC the Rooks and just celebrate. We got 51%. Then we celebrate the next day, it's back to the grind, having to study. But I learned, when I reflect now, is I learned that it's quite important that you celebrate even your small wins. And lately, it's coming back. I remember I was saying most of between 30 and 40, I never celebrated most of the things that I achieved. And when you tell people, why didn't you celebrate? So it's quite important you celebrate the small wins. Even it's like, even if you had a goal for this month or a weekend, you achieved maybe even one part of it, just celebrate. If it means going to buy your favorite ice cream or buying a nice flower for yourself, celebrate because it brings positive, it brings endorphins within your body and it has got a big psychological effect on how you tackle the next week and other challenges. So I would urge you to do that. So learn to celebrate. So I didn't know we were doing that. We're just saying, you know, we got 51%. Let's celebrate and we carried on. And even at school, since I said I didn't have many friends, most of the people I, uh, I was close with is the ones I came with from a, a, a gold field. So I met I met, there was one guy earlier, I thought I met, he became my friend. And then in school, I met Orulani, they became my friend. Then those two got married. So I was always checking along when they're joining together. So it was quite interesting. But the fact of just having few people within your life, that is what I was exposed to. So I didn't have a lot of, a lot of friends as well. And I'll say they were, those two really helped me to shape me and they were there for me. I remember when I had to go and do an op and I couldn't tell my family because they didn't know where I was. And my granny couldn't even reach where I, I had to, I had to go and remove my wisdom teeth. And those guys, they had to come all the way from class because the, the hospital said they won't release me until there's family and old friends. And they were always there, even December, they were always there. So I'll, I'll say, God always gives you people who need to be there in different stages of your life. I know they might not be there now, but at that time, at that stage of my life, they were there, they were supporting me. I felt that belonging. And it's quite important that if there are people who are there for you, who depend on you, you show that belonging to them. Because it goes a long, a long mile, because you might not know what they're going through, what the challenges they're going through. So it's, we need to reach out, because as human beings, we are meant to connect, we are meant to add value, and we are meant to relate. And for someone who's a loner or mostly introvert at times, it's quite difficult. And it doesn't mean as introverts, you don't wanna connect, you do wanna connect. And it depends, you might connect with other introverts, but it's quite important. You take care of those who, when they are with you, they feel at home and continue making, because you never know if that day that person might want to commit suicide. And just for you being there, showing their love, just changes their life to something else. So I was quite grateful with, with that as well. And when I say, I think what something that I wanna stress, I think I was, I remember I was in one relationship when I was still working in the three years when I was doing my, my three years of mental age, I was involved with this guy and I had to go and remove my tonsils in, I think it's, in Kruger stop, they've got a hospital there. And the beauty of having worked for Goldfield, because even when you're in school, you still have got medical aid. That was quite amazing. So I get released and 
asked the guy to pick me up and he says, no, I can't. So I had to lie to, to the doctors and say, no, there is someone waiting outside. And that day, if I didn't die again, so that was another second miss. I remember a taxi just passed me because I was still under, under the influence of anesthetic. So I lied because I had to leave the hospital. They had to give the bed to someone else and I couldn't just sit there. So yeah, I had to lie and say, no, there's someone waiting for me. And I had to walk to the Texas. How I got there and still being alive, I'm still here. So God's work in mysterious ways. So always, it's quite important those you say you love, be there for them when they need you, because you never know what is happening surrounding them. Yeah. So the message again from what I've just shared so far is there's a rainbow in everything that we are always going through. Because even when there's a rain, we start with the rain and later you see that, that ray of rainbow. So you might be going through something now and you go like, I don't see that rainbow. There is a rainbow. Just have the faith, have the vision and visualize where you want to go through and also speak to God. Because even in darkness, you might see that light and concentrate on that light. So what I've just shared so far is the learnings of that perseverance, asking and resilience can shape you to your destiny, to where you want to go through. And whatever I've gone through so far, it has shaped the person that I am. And people will just make a judgment of saying, ah, this person doesn't do this, but you don't know because you've never heard their story. So it's quite important that we share our stories and other stories brings healing. And you also, when you hear someone's story, you go like, wow, how did they do that? I also went through that and I was able to persevere. So another thing that with your stories, you need to be, sit with yourself and as, understand what is my pupils? Why did I have to go through this? And look for the diamonds in each stories that you're going through. Because everything that you have gone through is to shape you. And as human beings, we end up looking, concentrating on the 20%, which was the bad part and forgetting about the 80%, forgetting about the people who have been there, the people who, who believe in you and I think that is something when I started my working life it's concentrating on the 20% part of people not liking you because you start at work and you feel like you're this best person you've done this and these people need to know what you've been through and you realize that when you get to work you meet other people who are gonna show you your shadows <laughs> things that you still need to heal in all your life daily because work takes 80% of your time. You're just dwelling on this 20% and you forget the families, you forget the loved ones, you forget the life that is evolving. So that's another share, which I'll share next time. Any questions so far? I know you came late and Sandra, I'm not sure if you are following me. I should do. Yes, I'm following you, Sissy. What an inspiring story. Sorry, I, I came in late, but yes, I'm with you. Okay, thanks. Rafilo? Hey, Nontantla, are you okay? Hi, hey, hi, Mashudu, I'm good. I'm good. Um, yes, I'm sorry that I came late. I, I went to work and you know, I had to come and rush and get into his room. But yes, I'm inspired so far. Actually, you've got a, a similar story to mine. <laughs> And I'm like, wow, it's so amazing how God works, you know. 
and uh, the way you you mentioning how what you went through i'm like it, it just reminded me of my own journey uh, I, I guess it's because we all almost like a similar age so I, I guess we all went like most of us went through you know that inkata story i was also from so to so you know i can relate to to what you're saying and yes and it's, it's through god's grace and perseverance that we're able to make it uh not where we are today you know we're giving up and and um you know depending on the circumstances that were going on around us, but we just focused on the goal and what we wanted to do. And yeah, so you very you just reminded me of me. And thanks, thanks for that. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Rafila, are you with us? You're quiet. So you had another nickname for me, a shot of my shade with Shudu. Did you hear that one? <laughs> yeah, I know I heard it. <laughs> I'll use that next time. <laughs> yes, that one is also acceptable. It's fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'll, are you still okay? Can I continue? Or we call it a day? Hi, we're fine. We're enjoying it. Okay. We're reflecting on on, on, on on most of the things, you know, We're reminding us of our own things. Okay. It's, it's, I'm, I'm enjoying it. Okay, awesome. Okay, Lundy, let's see. I see non client is trying to join us, but she isn't connected through audio. Oh, I'll welcome her when she comes. So I think let me just share the lessons that I learned in that time when I was still at school, which also you need to be mindful even when you, 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 you have kids, I'm not saying be overprotective, because when you go to, when you leave your, your family, if it wasn't a welcoming family, kids just go out and just go and look for what they've been yearning, which they were not getting at school. So I would say for me, welcome, non tanke Shanya. We've got, yeah, two non tankers now. So what I've learned from that is that as much as I was a teenager, I learned that I want to be independent. And I told myself, when I leave home, I'll get that independence and life will be honky-dory, which wasn't. But through that, I learned that the challenges that I went through made me, they made me a better person. I would say the support structure that I had it, with each phase of my life has been quite amazing. I don't think now I'll be standing here. I think I would have been doing drugs. I might be a prostitute or might be, my life would have turned somewhere where I don't even want to think of, of it. So it would have just changed. Hey, why? I know it's a currently not way I need it to be, but it's getting there. So I'm excited about that. So it's quite important that it's, I'm still coming back to you guys being parents. Make sure that you take care of your kids. You make them feel loved so that whatever you're teaching them, the skills that you're teaching them, they can take it wherever they are. Even when they leave that door for the next three years, you feel confident that you've taught them so that they can have the discernment to make the right decisions wherever they are. Another thing as well is to teaching them to be self-sufficient and start doing it now as they're with you. If it means learning to clean the house, they need to. If it means learning to cook, even when they are studying, they have tests, they still have to do it because it's when they are working, they go through different things. So if they can learn the pressures now inside the house, they'll be able to manage it and also being disciplined because you find that when you're in the place of work and you've got someone who's not disciplined, they become a troublemaker wherever they are. 
they'll be getting discipline left and right and, and center. So also ask guidance from God to, to help you to be a conscious parent so that you can create that foundation. And then you'll, you, you'll be so amazed because your kids will always want to come back. So ask yourself currently, if your kids were to leave, would they want to come back to the house? If they're not, you've got a chance to change that now. So change it. So for me, I didn't want to go back home. Told myself, the moment I get a job, I'll find a place where I'm going to stay. I'm going to live my life. And then I became a loner, just being not minding about what is happening outside, just looking at my life. And, and that is not good. Because as human beings, we're supposed to relate, we're supposed to connect, we're supposed to create those bonds with other people. So make sure that you are creating the foundations. Your home is a place that your kids will come back to or want to, or any other one who who's there. And also build them, be open to them, talk to them about sex, talk to them about miscarriages, talk to them about also if you are able, if you are close, talk to them about your relationships, talk to them about marriage because now i remember with marriage i said oh, i just i had this fantasy of what marriage is and it wasn't what i thought and i had to learn through through that so i'll make it another video of how marriage it will also be a book that i'm busy gonna write how through marriage i learned to find myself and to grow and kicking and screaming even though I remember the first two years, I just wanted to, to divorce and run away because I didn't love myself that much. I had a fantasy of what marriage is and I didn't love myself. It comes back to what I spoke about when I started, when like I started knowing how to love myself in my twenties because I didn't know what love is. That's why I was able to get abused by people because I didn't know my worth. I didn't know how good enough I am. I didn't know that I was a gift that God has created on this earth and has brought to this life. And also with that experience, I learned that you need to listen to your gut because we've got that sixth sense that God gives us, which I doubted most of the time. Most I never used it. And I believe if I used it most of the time, I wouldn't have been through some of the challenges, but I think they had to happen. So I have to embrace what happened. But it's quite important you listen to that sixth sense. And you also find your identity because when you grow up, you get conditioned by your, the beliefs of your family or your caregiver, by your surroundings, by what's happening in society. And when you are above 20 and 30, you're trying to find your identity. And at the same time, you still say, I need to live this. So even, you, even now I'm asking, what is your identity? Can you identify your identity? Can you identify what are your beliefs? Are you living your beliefs? Or are you living your caregiver's beliefs? Are you feeling unstuck are you feeling are you fighting yourself you're saying i don't know what is really happening so it's your soul yearning to be revealed so if you are going through that find out what is you find your authentic you which is also what i'm i'm finding so i've learned in this journey to unlearn so many beliefs that i've learned through and also not worrying about being being judged because that used to kill me because i'll say what will people say but i had to learn that when i was born that day when i was born 43 years ago they were not there why did i make them why did i give them rental into my mind because even when i go hungry they are not there will they give me food which is something that we do in life. And when you are in your 20s and 30s and you're starting to work, you get that peer pressure. 
Are you driving the right car? Do you have the right house? Have you renovated your home, your parents' home and all that? So we go through that and we forget who we are. So I would say that is what I learned even at school. It's also interacting. I think something that I missed that I didn't do well, which was having fun. Yeah, learning to have fun. So if you're not learning to have fun, because when you have fun, you learn to forget, you learn to create connections, you learn to relax, because you're not always in that mode of working, of mode of, 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 of reading or anything. You start using both your brains, you start being creative and you start celebrating, which is something we, I didn't do often. So having fun going out there, because I learned a big thing last year, because now I work out I can even work until the next day and sleep for three hours. So I had a, a burnout last year, which was caused by me overworking, because I wanna do, do, do. I don't want to relax. And most people, they suffer from burnout because they don't have time for leisure. They don't have time just to have fun, just to say, so now I'm learning to schedule time and have fun. I know I'm not perfect, but it's better than I was because you suffer from burnout. And when you are suffering, if you are a parent or a loved one or a wife or your husband, everyone who's with you gets affected. And it just creates trauma as well. They also grieve because there are different ways of grief. You don't have to grieve because somebody died. It's because of that loss. So you're creating that. So learn to have fun. I'm learning. I'm not perfect. That is something that I'm doing. So that is what I didn't do when I was a teacher, just to have fun, to do crazy stuff. It's only now later I'm doing crazy stuff. Okay, I see non -clanker. Okay, I'll send you the, the, the recording. Thank you for coming through non -clanker. Okay, so it's quite important to have fun and taking care of your kids, taking care of your families and also teaching your kids to stand up for themselves, to learn to question stuff. Because when you're out there in the world, the world is so brutal, very brutal. So they need, when you start creating that foundation, they should be able to be these people who are principled, who are able to stand their ground. And even if things are not going well, they'll be able to say, I don't like it when you do this and do this to me because it makes me feel this way. Rather than shying, rather than shying away where they'll express their feelings. So teach them that, which is something that I had to learn at a later stage. And just standing up for yourself. Because even things, bad things when they happen in your soul, that thing that you have, the guiding star, it's always there, but you can't speak. So teach them that, teach them that. And I also learned that in that time when I was and still doing this three year, the influences that you get and being embroiled in fights in guys fighting for you, thinking you're the best thing ever. And then now when I reflect is that where are those people, they are gone. They are not there, but you had to learn a lot from that. And then after my third year, Oh, and also being dumped so many times. I remember this, it was a song, I need to share this story. I was once dumped and then after being dumped so many times, I had to learn to survive and say, each time I get dumped, I go and play this song. I forgot the name, like the lady. So I'll buy a JC celebrate and say, and sing, I know you have to leave me, but it's all right. It's all right. So one had to learn. One day you cry and you move on. So 
So it was another way of just saying, let it be. And I think that also helped. <laughs> and I wouldn't have done it with my crazy friends who were busy with me, who were busy, who I was with. That was Lieto and Rulani then. And they would be back crying, consoling me. Then the next time I back to school. I to disturb you. I still have huh? the CD, Monifa. <laughs> yes. I, I love, love it today. <laughs> <laughs> So I used to play that song. So that was my therapy. So there are songs that are quite therapeutic. Whilst I'm still there on therapy, I remember still when I was still in high school when I'm very angry with my mom and they're telling me, don't study, do this before you study. I'll play Kenny G whilst doing my work. So that was soothing. I never realized the song that he played they had something on my brain. Then it was just soothing. But when you later grow up and understand different genre, how they affect your brain and how they soothe you, it's so amazing. So yeah, so I played that song. I know you had to leave me, but it's all right. And then we move on. Then the guy will go like, you've forgotten me just like that. But I had to move on because I knew what was the main goal of being at school, what I was there to achieve, which I, I achieved. And then after my third year, I got retrenched because I, I, I mentioned earlier that we had been paid a salary by, by gold fields. So in 1999, the gold price went down. So they retrenched the, the graduates and the learner officials, and I was one of them. And I was left with doing my final year. So after that, I spoke to some guys. I went to, I remember Bramfontein, the way, I think it was NetBank. They were looking for analysts. So we had to do, to go and write exams because I'm like, now I don't know whether I'm going to continue this career of being a, met a metallurgist. There's no one who's going to take me to school at home. There's no one. So what am I going to do? So for, I think it was for two weeks, I went to those assessments. I passed the first round, second round, third round. I didn't do well. But my friend Leo did well. So he even left metallurgy then. He's still in the banking industry. So with me, I was still stuck. And then I said, what am I going to do? Because I'm not going to. Okay, thank you, Luandile. So I'm not gonna stay and I'm not gonna just stay at home. So I I took the pension fund because I told you guys that I was being paid a salary. So I learned I learned that they I there was a pension fund which I was contributing to. And and I took that pension fund and I finished my final year. So in, I went to complete my BTEC, studied, did my final year. And I didn't look like someone who didn't have a bursary and life carried on. And when I was at school, someone told me that the school was also employing students who can help students with their research who are in doing DTEC and MTEC. So, I went, I learned, and then the school took care, took me, and then I got paid. Though I was a student, paying them tuition, and also they were paying me a salary for helping the students. So that was a god. That was god. It was quite amazing. So I I passed, still working, taking care of myself, and people wouldn't have known that I still didn't have a best rate, But things went well. And with, with challenges which went through. And then in my, when I was, because I finished my, my BTEC in June and May, June, there was a company that was, DBS was looking for, they were looking for graduates and I applied. And they took me, so I remember it was a cold day and I had to find clothes to go to that interview in Jobek in, in, I forgot the place now, but it was a cold day and I went to the interview, it went well. And during that time, I also, the, the university was offering me to do an MTech, but I told myself, if you do an MTech, you become too highly qualified 
you become a research person and it will be difficult to get employed because I was asking around if you haven't worked before and you're just doing research, it would be employable. So yeah, I remember the day I went to the professor and I told him I'm not, I'm not studying further, I'm going to work, he was so angry with me. But what I value is the opportunities that were there and having the opportunity to make the decision for myself without being, being influenced and making the decision that I, at that time, was right. Because in life, when you make choices, it's either they, whatever choice you make, even when you don't make a decision, you have made a decision. You just have to live with the consequences. So the, the pension fund helped. Being employed at school helped, and I finished well. And then I got employed within a month Then I started going to the mining industry. I went, I went to the Northern Cape because my goal is that I don't want to stay near home. I don't want to, so even now I haven't been near so to most of my life. I've worked in the past 20, 21 years. I've worked far away from Jowick. So I think it's time to move to Jowick. I don't know, but June will tell me no. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, so that is what I have planned in in that. So questions or any reflections or anything you want to share from what I just said. And I feel like releasing you guys because I don't think I'll finish. Any thoughts, any comments? I, I, I was just looking at, at my way of doing things. I'm not far out. I think I'm, I'm, I'm doing well than my parents. Not that they didn't do well, but what you said about kids wanting to come back home, I think mines, they want to come stay at home and I'm telling them no. <laughs> <laughs> you need to have your own places please come visit <laughs> they're all crying but yeah that's good yeah and i've seen how close you are with your with your kids yeah yeah my buddies <laughs> my friends okay Okay, Rafida, yes. Yeah, I'll also share the recording because I'm feeling like, let me release people. <laughs> I'll continue with my story so that I don't rob you guys of the fun and the learnings that I got. Yeah. Part two. Yeah, I'll do part two. Okay, so part cool. one ended on, yeah, when I was starting to, with my career life, which have, I've been working for the past, how many years now? 20, 20, yeah, 23, so I'll share that. I hope what I've just shared today was inspiring. It has made you that to is. reflect on your life, on how you do things and how you can do things differently. Better, yeah. Yeah, and is. not judging people. Because it's quite important you hear someone's story, then you can relate to them. Because at times, for me, I know people they say I'm quiet from a distance, they just go like I'm unapproachable. But I love to talk. Yeah. Okay, now thanks, Nsiene, for sharing your story. I think I learned a lot. I know you from work. But uh, from today's session, I think I only knew maybe a small percentage of you. <laughs> yeah, so I think it was it was quite interesting to to listen to your to where you're coming from, from your childhood and you know up to where you are today. So thanks for inviting. Maybe next time we'll also extend invites to others if you are okay with that. Yes, others were invited. I shared in my social media 
because I know 30 people registered and there are a few people came, but it's, it's okay. Those who are here were meant to hear the story, so it's not about the numbers. It's about who's here, who spent. Maybe there was a message that I had to share to you that you had to hear. That is why you are here, so it's not by chance. No, thanks. Thanks a lot, Sensei. Thank you, Gati. Thank you, Rishide. Um, for sharing your story. It was such an inspiring story. You know, as I was listening to you, Sissy, I'm like, God um, always provided for you, you know, in the midst of it all, but God was always there providing for you. Obviously, you had to go through, you know, the ups and downs, but, you know, you can pinpoint to say what God was with you all the way. And I like the point uh, where you are referring to the kids. Um, Uguti, we need to teach them, <clears throat> um, you know, and uh, impart, you know, this knowledge to teach them how to clean, <clears throat> teach them what to say yes or when to say no, because I think we're raising another generation. They are able to stand up for themselves and say, no, yeah. I don't like it. Yes, I'm fine with it. Whereas some of us, you know, were never taught. Uh, one day, you and I will share my story, but, um, you know, things happen in that sense that you are told, no, not, not, never tell anyone. Yeah, boy, he, he, always speak like it. And then things started happening. But yeah, I must say, we're going to be raising another generation where they will be able to miss some of the things that we get through because of our teaching and obviously because of our enlightenment. So thank you so much, Sissy. I can't wait for part two and thank you so much for inviting me. Okay, thank you so much. Do share when I share the, the poster. Maybe someone needs to be there next week. Yeah. Okay, thank you guys. I really appreciate your time and, and just sitting and listening to me. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Okay, thanks. It's a Thank pleasure you. to ask my sweetheart. A really, really pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, bye. Good night. Bye. Bye, bye everyone.